Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Thanks, Mel. Oh, uh, the signs of trebuchets. I want to see what latch system thing they have to to release the ball. That's that's my main. Ooh, cool castle. The trebuchet is one of the largest and most destructive siege weapons to come out of the Middle Ages. These massive war machines were commonly used to break down enemy fortifications by launching heavy payloads, typically rocks and boulders weighing as much as 180 kilograms or 400 pounds. Projectiles could also include flammable material intended to cause fires, and things like sewage and animal carcasses would sometimes be thrown over castle walls in an attempt to spread disease. Range and accuracy were far superior to other weaponry at the time. I thought they didn't know about disease, so they knew it did something, but they didn't know about disease. So did they think they had like a, a god-like weapon? Uh as well, with some trebuchets being able to exceed a throwing distance of 400 meters, or about a quarter mile, depending on the weight of the object. Sorry, how far? A quarter mile? Exceed a throwing distance of 400 meters, or about a quarter mile, depending on the weight of the object. Although they have not been used for warfare in more than 500 years, trebuchets have still remained quite popular throughout much of modern history, and they are often constructed today for educational purposes and recreation. Whether it's for an engineering challenge, eating pumpkins in a fruit throwing competition eating or taking out a castle with one hit in age of empires hey these impressive machines have some serious power despite their simple design however the underlying physics is actually fairly complicated and we are going to find out why by taking a closer look at how the mechanism works a typical trebuchet consists of a sturdy base and a large frame and this support I imagine they would i would imagine you would practice with smaller scales and then once you get it right just Okay. A, long a typical trebuchet consists of a sturdy base and a large frame, and this supports a long beam that is mounted on an axle. Construction is primarily done with heavy timber, however the components may also be reinforced with leather, rope, and metal, among other materials. The beam is positioned off-center so that one side is approximately four to six times longer than the other, and a counterweight is suspended from the shorter end, usually with a hinged connection so it can swing freely. This is basically just a large wooden box filled with a heavy substance like sand, rocks, or lead, and it can weigh as much as 20 metric tons depending on the weight of the payload being thrown. The short end of the beam Jeez. is often thicker or reinforced in order to carry the load from the counterweight, which also has the advantage of lowering its moment of inertia by moving the center of mass towards the pivot point. At the opposite end, the projectile is carried by a sling that is attached to the trebuchet with two ropes, Here we go. one that is securely fixed to the beam, and another that slides freely over a finger so the payload can be released. This finger can be any kind of projection, such as a peg or a hook, and its angle can be adjusted in order to set the release point. To launch the projectile, a trebuchet employs the law of conservation of energy by storing potential energy in the counterweight and then converting it to kinetic energy. The counterweight is first lifted to a certain height using a winch or tread wheel that is connected to the throwing end of the beam, where its potential energy can be calculated by multiplying its mass by acceleration due to gravity and its height above the bottom of the swing. Since the beam acts as a lever and the lifting force is applied at the longer end, the force that is required to lift the counterweight is actually a lot less than the counterweight itself. If the throwing end is four times longer than the short end, then the lifting force only needs to be one quarter of the counterweight. However, the displacement also needs to be four times greater. Once the beam is in the correct orientation, it is tied down to a release mechanism and detached from the winch, and the sling is positioned on a guide chute along the base of the trebuchet where the projectile is loaded. When the beam is released, the falling counterweight causes rotational acceleration because the applied torque is significantly greater than the resistance from the payload, and the I still want to know how, how the finger wor uh acceleration because the applied torque is significantly greater than ah. the resistance from the payload, and the projectile is launched into the air as the free end of the sling slides off the peg. The torque from the counterweight is not constant through the entire motion, however, because the distance between the line of action and the pivot point changes, and the acceleration of the beam will reach a maximum when it is perfectly horizontal. The speed of the projectile will also be many times faster than the speed of the counterweight, since the sling follows a much wider arc, which again comes back to the ratio between the long and short end of the beam. If the ratio is still 4 to 1 like before, then the tip of the long end will travel 4 times faster than the tip of the short end. However, centripetal acceleration also 
causes the sling to pivot around the end of the beam at an even faster rate, which increases the radius and further amplifies the linear velocity. This double pendulum action is the thing that gives trebuchets their awesome power and range, but it also makes their behavior difficult to analyze and predict. If all of the potential energy and the counterweight were... I just wonder if anyone... Like, do they have any punishment for an engineer who, like, didn't do it correctly? Like, what if they didn't angle the finger quite correctly? ...dial will also be many times faster than the speed of the counterweight. Actually, the counterweight is not... Hold on. ...changes, and the acceleration of the beam will reach a maximum when it is perfect to weight the short end of the beam. Like, what if it releases, like, right here, and it just goes kind of straight up and then lands on someone, or... If the ray short, even faster pendulum action is the thing that gives trebuchets their awesome power and range, but it also makes their behavior difficult to analyze and predict. If all of the potential energy in the counterweight were converted to kinetic energy in the projectile, then we could simply apply the law of conservation of energy to compute the theoretical velocity and throwing distance. But in reality, these machines are not 100% efficient. There will always be some amount of energy Wait, remaining in the system after the payload is released, because the beam and counterweight will still be in motion. And so the maximum energy that can be transferred to the projectile is therefore between 70 and 80 percent before accounting for losses due to friction and air resistance. If we want to study the physics and model the behavior accurately, then it becomes necessary to break the trebuchet down into its primary components so that the equations of motion can be derived for each part individually. This is done by drawing free body diagrams and summing the forces and torques in each direction, which can be a little tedious because of the complex geometry. But the end result is a system of differential equations that describes the movement uh... of the components in relation to one another. Now, unfortunately, these equations cannot be solved analytically to obtain a closed form solution. However, the system can- Flashbacks. This is when- the... I- I didn't know what I was going to major in going into college. I was undeclared, liberal arts, I guess you could call it, um, un just undeclared major, and I wasn't the best student in high school, but then I, more treatment of ADHD and stuff like that, I, I got a bit better, and my confidence going into college in terms of my grades was super high, like, I was like, bring it on, you know, and then, so, like, I like, I like science, physics, I remember talking to, like, a buddy who's biology major, Anyways, it was like, phys I'm like, oh, physics. And then I, I just reached a point where I'm like, I I all right, you win. I'm not smart enough, okay? I could deal with, like, the 101 class, maybe the, the next class. I did theoretical physics, somehow got a B. But after that, I was just, eh. and all of this, I'm, I want to blow all of this up. It's still be solved iteratively by using a numerical integration method. This type of problem needs to be divided into a number of small time increments and solved sequentially, as opposed to finding a single governing equation, which means that the entire motion must be simulated from start to finish in order to obtain a full solution. Something that makes the problem slightly more complicated is the fact that the constraints are not constant. And so the- Like you said all those fancy words, like the- Means that the entire motion must be simulated from start like to the, finish- Like the extra speed it gets from the centrifugal whatever. And I might not, you know, all the words, whatever, but I know what he meant. Like, when you whip a thing, a, a stick with, like, a rope on the end of it, it the ball is going to want to go fast, but it's attached to the stick, the stick so it's going to whip around really even faster and maybe hit you, but... ...in order anyways. to obtain a full solution. Something that makes the problem slightly more complicated is the fact that the constraints are not constant, and so the analysis also needs to be broken up into three different stages. When the beam and counterweight are first released, the sling is initially in contact with the guide chute and it is only able to travel in one direction parallel to the surface. But at the moment the sling is lifted away from the chute, its movement becomes unconstrained and the equations of motion change. The equations change again just a few moments later when the sling is released from the beam, at which point energy is removed from the system and the projectile continues off on its own following a simple parabolic trajectory. Because the constraints on the projectile are slightly different at each stage, a separate analysis needs to be conducted for each part of the sequence, where the endpoint of the previous Great. stage is taken as the initial condition for the next. Once this has been completed and the differential equations are solved, the final result is a complete simulation of the trebuchet, which can be used to track the path of the projectile during the throw, along with its velocity and acceleration at every point. It is particularly- Hey, I'm just gonna say this. I think I get tired of it because- next. It's like, people will become too smart that they can't be stupid, and you need to be stupid in order to teach. Not be stupid, but, like, 
the the sequence where the end the end point of the sequence becomes the initial of of the following sequence. Yeah, I I understand what that means, okay? But why do you got to say it like that, okay? Just where it ends here is where it starts here. And this is where you got to figure out the motion here. The initial ah, I'm just mad because I'm not good at physics. The point of the previous stage is taken as the initial condition for the next. Once this has been completed and the differential equations are solved, the final result is a complete simulation of the trebuchet, which can be used to track the path of the projectile during the throw, along with its velocity and acceleration at every point. It is particularly useful to find the speed and direction at the release point, since this determines where the projectile will strike, and it can also be used as a design tool to help optimize a trebuchet by finding a set of parameters that will maximize the throwing distance. For example, it can be shown that the range will be greatest when the sling and throwing end of the beam are approximately equal in length, when the long end of the beam is roughly four times greater than the short end, and when the beam is initially set at a 45 degree angle. The counterweight should also be about 100 times heavier than the payload in order to get as close to a freefall as possible, and the projectile should be released from the sling at 45 degrees from horizontal, which happens to be the optimal angle for a standard projectile motion problem. Makes Together, sense. these parameters will produce a design that is very close to optimal, and although they have been derived using modern physics principles, it's interesting to see that many trebuchets from the Middle Ages were actually constructed with similar proportions. The trebuchet was invented more than 500 years before Isaac Newton was around to establish the basic laws of motion, and I think this says a great deal about the ingenuity of the medieval engineers who built these incredible machines. So Castle how did they do this if gravity wasn't invented yet? That makes no sense. This were simply no match for one of the most powerful siege weapons of all time, so it's a good thing they are no Frank. longer a threat today. However, it is still important to defend your virtual castle by using a service like NordVPN. Using a VPN helps... Guys, please make sure to use, uh, if this interests you, and it interests you from this video, to use their link. Original link to the video, top of the description, below, uh, and uh, use the link, alright? It helps them out. To keep you protected by routing your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel, which allows you to browse websites anonymously without being tracked the by initial. your ISP or third parties. NordVPN secures your data with advanced encryption protocols, and their strict no data logging policy Look, I get ensures it. Like, that if your you're in that level of, is never of science, of, that, of education, in and you're one of my talking uses to for people who are also at that level, which allows you to then yeah, it's not our problem. You don't know the terminology, region. right? All you but at the same time, on a country don't you be that guy appear. who purposely seconds, chooses you can browse the, the most smart-sounding words to make yourself seem smart this is when you're really just being an, an ass. Oh, ah. like Netflix and HBO I'm just mad at myself for not... Where these services are unavailable. And NordVPN has no limit on bandwidth. No, it's for the best. So you are free to watch unlimited content from anywhere on any device. I definitely recommend giving it a try for yourself by going to nordvpn.com slash artofengineering, where they are currently offering a huge discount on a two-year plan. It's completely risk-free with their 30-day money-back guarantee, and if you sign up now with code Art of Engineering, then you can also get one extra month for free. NordVPN is a powerful tool that I personally use myself, and they always help me out by sponsoring this channel, so please go check them out at nordvpn.com slash artofengineering using the link in the description. Don't forget to leave a like and hit subscribe if you enjoyed today's video. Cool video. Really awesome. Loved it. Art of Engineering, I, I will give it a sub was good um i hope you guys learned something or can teach me something down in the comments i understand okay i'm not trying to say it's just like sometimes i think people purposely make things sound i understand this could just be me being not smart okay but sometimes purposely use the most technical terms to to describe something and yeah but if you're trying to teach a wide audience then, then dumb it down, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, it was great. Um, cool video. No, I'm just, I'm just mad at other stuff. Love you guys. See you guys next time. Bye.